Right. Okay, so our next presentation, very, very exceptionally, is going to be re remotely presented by Anna Zemianko from all the way from Poland. So um, go away. Understanding to allow me to deliver my presentation online and participate online, considering this forced me here that prevented me from coming to Brno, regrettably. But I'm still happy to be able to connect um, online and be here with you remotely. So let's get down to the presentation. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Invisible Pictures in Online Dictionaries. Uh, shall we see them? Pictures are considered a welcome feature of online dictionaries, and uh, research shows that they are useful in reception and retention. But their harmful effect on vocabulary, vocabulary learning has also been um, attested. And there is research which indicates that they happen to be overestimated by students who sometimes think um, that they learn more with their help than they actually do. So um, the question as to whether pictures should be included in online dictionaries is still a valid one. Also, considering this widespread availability of images on the internet and our frequent reference to photo-oriented sites and applications. Another relevant question is how to display pictures in online dictionaries, if at all. And here we have to remember that um, presentation space is severely constrained in handheld portables, but also in regular computers where dictionaries uh, are still accessed, online dictionaries are still accessed. So um, maybe hyperlinking pictures might be more commendable than making them instantly visible in entries. And this is a question I'd like to uh, explore. And my aim is to see if the presence of pictures in online dictionaries and uh, their access path affect uh, meaning, reception, and retention. I formulated four research questions. Another one, um, the same pictures create for taking hyperlinks. And in the last version, there were no pictures uh, at all. Um, the entries were otherwise the same. They just differed in uh, pictures and availability. Uh, here we see a screenshot of um, the test version with, uh, with a picture. Uh, I used pictures in color, and they were pictures of single objects with no background uh, issues. Uh, here we can see um, a sample of the test of the test version with um, a hyperlinked picture, um, and the link is going to go to exactly the picture which we've just seen in the other version. And here is the test version without any uh, link on picture. Two hundred and thirty-eight uh, upper intermediate students published the part of the study were all native speakers of Polish, and um, they were uh, randomly assigned to the uh, experimental conditions, and they were quite distributed across the test versions. Um, the study was conducted in regular, regular classes um, in a computer lab, and the participants were seated at uniform of uh, computers. In the experimental session, uh, my participants first got the free test, um, and they were requested to provide equivalence, L1 equivalence of uh, the target nouns blank just of their knowledge of English. Um, and the aim was to check whether they were familiar with the uh, target words before um, the study. And if they were, if they knew the words, such cases were eliminated from further analysis. Immediately after the pre test, uh, they took the green test. Uh, where they supplied L1 equivalents on the basis of dictionary consultation. And the three test versions made it possible for me to uh, see whether uh, pictures affect this option. And uh, right after the main test, uh, the participants were uh, given this test. And here uh, they also 
want to know what's going on but from memory. And this way I checked uh, immediate retention. And each uh, stage of the study, uh, the sequence of the words was randomized. And subject's answer was considered correct. And one point, uh, if it coincided with an equivalent uh, funnel in uh, leading bilingual English college uh, dictionary on paper or online. Uh, rarely did my participants try to uh, provide descriptive explanations of the target numbers in Polish, but such attempts scored no points uh, because the translation for always, because uh, uh, the explanation for always translations of uh, definitions. Um, I computed one way over for each unit variable that is meaning, perception, and retention. And um, access to features was like between the independent variable because one participant um, dealt with one test version only. Any significant results were further analyzed by the target test. So, we um, present the results. Uh, first, I would like to point out uh, that um, the hyperlinks uh, were clicked. So, um, uh, Virtually all the participants uh, accessed uh, pictures, pictures by clicking hyperlinks, and what world that only uh, two subjects uh, neglected the hyperlinks in uh, most entries. Um, the data show that uh, research was dependent on pictures. Um, uh, it was the most successful when pictures were available by default and when they were hyperlinked. Uh, with no difference between these two conditions. Um, in each of them, the reception was about one third better than what there were no pictures with in all trees. And of course, this difference was significant. Retention um, also proves to be affected by pictures, but in a different way. Um, um, retention was facilitated to the largest extent by pictures available by default. And hyperlinked pictures uh, proved to be better than pictures, uh, but entries without the pictures. There was no these two conditions. Uh, but in the two conditions, uh, retention was uh, respectively one fourth and one third worse than um, when uh, no pictures were visible. And these uh, differences were significant. Um, so um, let me present a few conclusions from the study. Um, so, the, the study shows that understanding meaning is affected by the presence of pictures and trees, and um, this, is, uh, uh, this is an answer to my first research question. Um, it also turns out that the way of accessing pictures um, doesn't matter really for reception, because pictures available by default are uh, as useful as hyperlink ones, and uh, they improve retention by about one third, and it was um, uh, my answer to the second research question. Uh, learning meaning um, does depend on pictures are instantly visible in entries or hyperlinked. Um, and that's uh, my answer to question number three. Uh, uh, and the data shows that instantly visible pictures are the best for uh, learning meaning. Uh, hyperlinked pictures uh, are only as good as pictureless entries. They have no uh, practical impact, no useful impact on learning. And this is my answer to research question four. Um, the role of access to pictures in learning meaning is a little bit surprising, uh, especially considering the involvement in all the hypotheses. Uh, this hypothesis predicts that um, a great effort in accessing information results in that learning. And we can assume that uh, clicking hyperlinks uh, takes more effort than uh, seeing pictures uh, immediately in entries. So, um, radically at least, it should, it should produce a stronger memory trait and resor result in better learning, but it was not the case in this experiment. Um, the cognitive load hypothesis might not need an explanation. This uh, hypothesis assumes that um, a needlessly compli complicated presentation of information is detrimental to learning. 
because it reduces cognitive powers, which should be invested in processing the information to be learned, rather than wasted on uh, analyzing the needlessly complicated present presentation. Uh, hyperlinking pictures uh, apparently makes meaning presentation less straightforward and uh, engages dictionary users' cognitive powers, which uh, should otherwise be uh, invested in uh, learning the content. It's also surprising that um, almost everybody in the study consistently accessed hyperlinked pictures and entries. And I think uh, there may be three reasons for it. Uh, first, uh, I think that the participants might have felt insecure trying to understand definitions. And maybe they decided to see pictures to uh, ask meaning, to understand uh, meaning better. Um, second, I think that um, the participants may have understood the definitions, but needed some confirmation of uh, their predictions or, or initial understanding. And that's why they um, decided to see pictures to um, help uh, to get help and visualization of the objects and of course uh, to confirm their understanding and finally i think that uh, the participants uh, may have had problems with coming up with uh, equivalence of college um, possibly that's why they uh, decided to see pictures to be able to name the objects more more easily and this brings us implementation of the study, one of many, but one I'd like to highlight is that uh, possibly the definitions were understood, but uh, equipments in Polish were difficult to come up with. And this, uh, this problem can be put down to the selection of target items because they uh, denoted um, um, rare uh, objects in the subject's immediate surroundings. Um, they denoted objects which were not used by the subjects or even um, found in their uh, closest environment. Um, this is this seems to be a natural consequence of um, selecting uh, frequent nouns which are supposed to be familiar to upper primitive students. But I think that in further um, uh, investigations into um, illustrations from dictionaries, it might be useful to uh, use to include different words um, whose equivalent in um, L1 would be easier to come up with. But this would, of course, be moving learners um, uh, of lower proficiency levels. Um, I also think that it might be interesting to investigate uh, uh, whether access to pictures matters to dictionary consultants on mobile devices. Uh, we have to remember that um, presentation space is severely constrained on such devices, um, and uh, lexicographers might be particularly tempted to um, uh, hyperlink pictures or provide miniature pictures expandable upon tapping. But we don't know whether hyperlinks or those expandable miniatures are more recommendable. And um, this is what I mean. Here we see an entry, and at the bottom there is uh, a picture that can be clicked or tapped, and it expands into um, what we would call a scenic or synoptic illustration. So it collates a, a set of um, thematically related objects and some complex, and those collated objects are identified by labels. But of course, um, um, quite understandably, uh, dictionary users would need to invest some effort to find a picture of the uh, word looped up. So I think that uh, further uh, studies uh, could provide an answer to the question whether it's better to provide a hyperlink to uh, one picture, to a single picture, or maybe um, uh, a miniature expandable picture um, where the target um, object would have to be found among related items.
Yes, uh, I'm just finishing. <laughs> And um, I think it might be also worthwhile to um, consider um, um, a different task and different t test items in different uh, in further research, um, uh, because I'm not sure if hyperlinks um, um, could be used so willingly in a different um, design. Uh, if participants were not requested to provide an L1 equivalence, or if more frequent nouns were used uh, in, um, in experiments, uh, I think that learners might be less eager to click hyperlinks. But this is, of course, a hypothesis that needs to be verified in further studies. For now, um, the uh, data which I have collected uh, justifies justify giving an affirmative answer to the question which I posed um, in the title of my talk. Oh, we see pictures in all my dictionaries. And the answer is um, yes, we hope. With that, they should be displayed by default if we want to remember meaning. Um, thank you so much for our kind attention. Well, thank you very much. This is very interesting research, given that lexicographers have been obsessing about pictures in dictionaries <laughs> since ever, and uh, we still have so many unanswered questions about how they actually affect the users and how we should actually show them in dictionaries because they take up so much screen space. So uh, lots of interesting questions. So any questions from the audience here? If uh, and uh, b before I give you the microphone, if you say the question into the microphone, Anna probably isn't going to be able to hear them, but I will repeat the questions into the laptop here. So hopefully that's going to work out. Or you can come up. Yes, of course. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not do it the easy way? <laughs> so Robert is going to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. For, that's a very interesting study and presentation. Um, two points that mm -hmm. come to mind immediately. Um, I wonder if the cognitive load paradigm is uh, may the best or the only way to account for this, uh, since uh, here we seem to have um, verbal and visual stimuli. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in terms of retention, that's the uh, retention, the interesting effect <laughs> and unexpected. Um, perhaps we might want to consider what affects, I mean, what supports or promotes the establishment of associations where you have a visual stimulus and a verbal, a, a label, a verbal label. And I don't, I'm not sure that cognitive load hypothesis goes into this detail. It's more about, you know, general. Uh, and maybe a related question, given these preliminary results, maybe for future research, I wonder uh, what would happen if we had a condition with just the label and the uh, illustration with no definition, because it seems like the definitions might be just a nuisance in this case. Um, so just, I don't know if you have any immediate uh, responses to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. Um, when it comes to the first one, I mean, the cognitive load being, uh, being um, kind of constrained to this verbal presentation rather than visual, yes, it is true because the hypothesis was created um, um, in an attempt to ignore for uh, the verbal context, definitely not uh, multimodal contexts of uh, learning words, but I'm not sure whether it's impossible to extend it um, also to uh, multimodal presentations. Um, uh, when it comes to the second one, um, yeah, that's an interesting one, just a label and um, uh, an illustration without any definition. So as if we were then testing uh, pictorial um, dictionaries without this horrible input. Yeah, that's an interesting one, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting suggestion for further studies. I haven't thought about it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we have a bit, bit of time left, so I'll just read out two questions from the online uh, broadcast, yeah. and then we return to questions here in the audience. So uh, somebody is asking, Anna Frankenberg is asking, thank you for your presentation. Uh, w would you say that looking up pictures in dictionaries compare compares with uh, searches on Google Images? Maybe if you could, Anna, just answer very quickly, yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know whether it differs, uh, it compares, how it compares with searches on Google Images. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I think that, I think, I, I think, but it's just a wild guess. I think that uh, looking up things, images on, uh, um, I mean, looking up images is faster, okay? Um, if we look at Google Images, I think it's, it's, uh, it's definitely faster, I think, and it's uh, also um, maybe it serves some other purposes. Um, I think rather than than just uh, trying to understand meaning, maybe I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but it's a nice question. Um, it's a very nice question. Thank you, Anna, for this. So something to think about. Another question uh, from Lorna. Loma, Laura. <laughs> um, uh, she's asking, do you think that the participants were s curious to see the pictures behind the hyperlinks because this was a test? Maybe, yes, definitely. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that they wanted to perform well. They wanted to do what they were expected to do. Of course, yeah, it's also a, it's also a, a, a possibility and it's a limitation of, um, of the study and of um, the experimental approach, yeah, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Then we have one more question here from the audience mm -hmm. coming up right now. <laughs> Speak into both the computer and the microphone. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, I'm wondering if you think it would be interesting to study if there's individual like what's the role of individual variability or variation in the learners because uh, people have different memories and um attention and what if it's a neurotypical person but what if it's a non-neurotypical person like someone who struggles with attention and um, do you think it would be interesting to make groups based off of some kind of cognitive property of the participants Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this question. Yes, of course, uh, of course, it would be very nice and very interesting. And not only this, I think that it would be uh, it would also be interesting to uh, group participants into visual and verbal learners. Uh, so simple as that. We some of us learn better uh, from pictures that are learned better from words. Uh, yeah, definitely, it's a very nice um, suggestion. Thank you very much for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's pretty much it for now for this talk. Thank you very much, Anna. That was uh, very informative, very interesting, lots of interesting questions. Also, the online hybrid thing worked out remarkably well. So uh, thank you very much. We have a five minute gap and then we come back thank again you. for another talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.